So today we're going to look at how we determine the magnetic force on a moving charged object. As we've already learned, the only thing that can create a magnetic field is a moving charge. Magnetic fields are just like the fields we've already talked about, like electrostatic fields. Electrostatic fields need to have a charged object in order to feel the force, as we would say. Gravitational forces. Gravitational forces need mass in order to feel, again, the gravitational force. All right, so same thing with magnetic force. So for a magnetic force to be exerted on an object, that object needs to also be creating magnetic field. So how does an object create magnetic field? Well, it must have a net charge and it must be moving. So let's look at a couple of examples of this and then we'll get on to how we actually determine the direction of the force because it's a little bit complicated, but hopefully we can get through it today. We all know the aurora borealis are a spectacular display happening above, but do you really know what causes it? What is the aurora borealis? When we watch that dazzling display of light, it's actually telling us a story. It's a story that began on the sun, traveled all the way to Earth, had a series of interactions in the magnetic field and led to this beautiful display overhead. The aurora borealis are caused by particles, electrons and protons blasted out from the sun in all directions and colliding with gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Those particles travel 150 million kilometers from the sun to reach Earth. That can take from two to four days. That flow of particles is called the solar wind. A lot of particles when they reach the magnetic field are deflected away into space, but some become trapped in the magnetic field. And what's going on is that there's this little spark that occurs, this release of energy that we see in the form of light. And so now imagine that overhead there are billions of these tiny little sparks going on. And the sequence of light, these little flashes of light, are what we see and call aurora. So if you're living in northern Canada or northern Scandinavia, northern Russia, around the North Magnetic Pole, and you look up, what you're seeing is this waterfall of particles that are following a magnetic field line into Earth's upper atmosphere. So why are they different colors? The Earth's atmosphere is made up of nitrogen, oxygen, and other gases, commonly known as air. The colors of the aurora depends on the gas molecules that the particles are mixing with. So green, the most common color of aurora, is a charged particle mixing with oxygen. Blue is when they mix with nitrogen. Generally along the lower edge, we see a really intense, very vibrant purple color. That's an indication of that, of particles interacting with nitrogen. Astronomer and physicist Galileo actually coined the term aurora borealis in 1619. It was after aurora, the Roman goddess of mourning. He mistakenly thought that the auroras were due to sunlight reflecting from the atmosphere, according to NASA, though indigenous northerners have oral traditions about the lights that go back generations. How high up are the auroras? Aurora are between 100 and 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. How high is that? The International Space Station orbits the Earth at about 400 kilometers above the surface. Astronauts on the space station often get a side view of the aurora. That's still cool too, because the side view of an aurora can give you an unbelievable show. It, it, it shows you that how tall an aurora can be. Saturn and Jupiter also have beautiful auroras, even more powerful than Earth. There is a lot of mystery around the aurora though. Scientists are always looking at new missions to better understand the relationship between the sun and the Earth and forecasting auroras and space weather. Modern day technology like cell phones also depend on that research since satellites can be affected by the solar wind. So why are aurora more visible in the north? Well, most auroras occur in a band called the auroral oval. That's a huge ring of aurora above the Earth's north and south magnetic poles. The northern lights we see are just a small section of the auroral oval. Places like Alaska, Greenland, Scandinavia, and northern Canada are the perfect zone because they're close to the auroral oval. If you're at high latitudes anywhere on the planet, chances are every single night there is auroral activity overhead. When there is active space weather, it can push the auroral oval like an elastic band further south. That's when people right across Canada and even the United States can see the aurora. And let's not forget the southern lights. People living near the South Pole can see the Aurora Borealis's cousin, Aurora Australis. It's really, truly a scientific wonder. And there's a lot that we still don't know about. 
when it comes to the aurora. Some of the most uh, uh, experienced scientists say that uh, for every question that's answered, there are 10 more that need to be answered. It's a beautiful way to watch the sun and the earth uh, and their magnetic connection. Um, and it tells a beautiful scientific story. Okay, so the video on the Aurora Borealis is pretty cool. So what is the Aurora Borealis? It's solar wind that interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetosphere, and then it causes it to deflect. And when the charged particles deflect around the Earth, they give off light and we can see them. So the Aurora Borealis is an excellent example of a moving charge in a magnetic field. If we didn't have the Aurora Borealis, we would get blasted by these solar storms and stuff on the uh, sun, and they would just wipe us out. We wouldn't be able to handle the radiation. So the magnetic field of the Earth is really important to us because it deflects the majority of the solar wind away from our planet. Next, we'll look at a video where um, we've already seen how Orsted found that, hey, there's a magnetic force on a compass when there's current in a wire. So therefore, we've learned that moving charges create magnetic field. Well, let's take a look at how we determine the direction of that. So the next video clip is just a short example of a demonstration that I would do in class. And, and it's really it's really pretty cool. A lot of people are like, whoa, that's awesome. But um, so let's take a look at this demonstration and then we'll discuss it further in a couple of minutes. So I have here a large magnet, South Pole, North Pole. So the field is pointing up. And then I have a big, uh, well, copper tube, which is connected to the wires here and there. When I connect these here, electricity will flow through this guy, through the red, through the copper tube, and then up through ground and then back home. So we'll have electricity flowing this way, magnetic field pointing up. We expect a force inward. And sure enough, we get an inward force. Now, if I reverse the direction of the current, we expect an outward force. Get this guy out of the way. And there you see it floating there. Because now that I've reversed the direction of the current, current is flowing this way, magnetic field is pointing up. We expect an outward force. And that's what you say. Right-hand rule, simplified. Okay, so the guy that was doing this demonstration had an interesting setup. He had stuff that was uh, vertical. So basically, what did he have? He had a magnetic field created by a magnet that went from north to south. Okay, he had a current traveling through there. And then it created a force that was in a third direction. Okay, so this is going this way, this is going that way, and the force is up. His stuff was all kind of rotated on the side, but it did the same thing. He had a north to south field going from bottom to top, a current going through the wire, and a force that acted perpendicular to the wire. So let's look at how we actually determine that. Well, first of all, we need to get a coordinate system, just like all of other physics. We have forces, forces are vectors. Um, so here's a Cartesian coordinate that you're familiar with already. It's called a right-hand Cartesian coordinate, all right? Um, we won't get into why it's called right-hand, but it's always like X on this axis, Y on this axis. Or you can rotate it, you know, uh, 90 degrees or something like that. But X and Y are always, perpendicular to each other. Well, as we may have seen in the previous video clip, our forces act in three dimensions. So that's a little harder to draw. So let's take a look at the same right-hand Cartesian coordinates in 3D.
Okay, there we go. 3D right-hand Cartesian coordinates. So you notice now, it doesn't matter which is in what axis, okay? It's just rotated. So now we have Y, that's kind of going through here on a diagonal, Z, which is up and down, and X, which is left and right. Okay, so this is kind of, if you, if you like, put your face over here, it's kind of like this one's either coming at you or going away from you. Okay, so that's the important thing is we want to be able to draw three dimensions on a piece of paper. All right, we want to be able to draw up and down, boop, left and right. And again, put your face over here, either toward you or away from you. So let's look at how we do that. What we're going to do is we're just going to use this coordinate system up and down, left and right, and the axis coming toward you and going away from you. Don't worry about the X's and Y's. I should have gotten rid of all that. All right. So just up and down, left and right, and then kind of visualize going away from you or coming toward you or going, I should say even better, going away from you into the computer screen and coming toward you out of the computer screen. Well, these are vectors. So we know that we can represent a vector as an arrow. So let's look at the first thing of something going into the screen. Well, what we want to do is think of it as an arrow that maybe is shot into a pool of water. All right. The last thing that you're going to see is the tail of the arrow. So anything that's an X, like the feathers on the back of an arrow, or either a circle with an X or just a plain X, that means going into the screen. So now we have 3D. We have up and down, left and right, and into the screen. Well, if we have into the screen, we can also have out of the screen. So we want to think of that as maybe an arrow coming toward us. All right. So if you see an arrow coming toward you, we can draw it as like an open dot. Sometimes it's an open, well, I should say an open circle. Sometimes it's an open circle with a dot in the middle of it, or sometimes it's just a filled in circle. Right. So there's actually three of them. I have two here. There's a filled in circle, an open circle, just like this one's a circle. This one would be like that one. All right. And then sometimes people will draw actually a circle with a little dot in it. So now we have three things. We have up and down, left and right, and into and out of the page. So let's define the variables that we'll be using. So here we go. Most of these you're pretty familiar with, but we'll just do a quick refresher. So F is force, and it's in newtons. B is something new. That's magnetic field strength. So we have magnetic field strength, and its units are Teslas. No, not after the car. It's long before the car. The car was named after either magnetic field or Nikolai Tesla, and uh, magnetic field strength is named after Nikolai Tesla. Now I write QV, all right? Well, that's charge times velocity. If you recall, to have a force or to create a magnetic field, the charge has to be moving. So we need both charge and velocity. And it just so happens that any time we use them, we multiply them together. So we're going to have charge in coulombs and velocity in meters per second. And lastly, current. Well, current is moving charges, but it's confined to a wire. And so current is in amperes. Okay, here comes the difficult part. So if you notice this hand, it's your right hand, don't use your left hand. We call it the right hand rule for a reason. And it's because we use our right hand. So here we go. If you'll notice, I have three dimensions. I have up and down. I kind of have a left and right, and I have an in and an out. All right, so we use our hand, not our left hand. We use our right hand in order to determine the direction of the force. So let's take a look at how we go about that. Um, first of all, we want to look at the magnetic field. So magnetic field B, all right? When we have field lines, it's a whole bunch of vectors all pointing in the same direction. So if we look at that, magnetic field is B, all right? And we use our fingers 
because we have a lot of fingers, we have a lot of field lines. So we're going to point our finger in the direction of the magnetic field. So align your fingers in the direction of a magnetic field. The next variable that we have is either current, I, or QV, velocity times charge. That's going to always go in the direction of your thumb. The way I try to remember that is, hey, how do you point to a certain direction? Um, you know, hitchhiking, which is not advisable, but uh, if you were hitchhiking, you would point your thumb in the direction you want to go. So we have magnetic field pointing in the direction of our fingers. QV or I pointing perpendicular to that. If we look, this part of the hand is perpendicular to that. It makes a right angle. And then third, we have to have a direction for force. So force comes out of your palm. So we could think of that as, well, if we're going to push on something, what do we usually do? We use our palm to push on something. So we like to put the force coming out of the palm. All right. So there's our three parts of the right hand rule. It's magnetic field. Okay. QV or I and force. Now let's take a look at how we actually apply that to some example problems. You don't have these problems in your notes, but they're just problems that I, I made this video some time ago. So I'm going to attach that to the end of this. So I'm going to show the video which illustrates the three parts of the right hand rule and how we use them, how we make it a diagram and so forth and find out the direction of force based on the direction of magnetic field and the direction of motion of a charge. When I say a charge, I mean like an object that's charged, like we would charge pith balls or something. Okay, today I want to discuss with you the three parts of the right hand rule and how they relate to the diagrams that will be used to find the force of a charge particle that is moving through a magnetic field. First of all, we have to look at how we draw our fields. All right. So field lines are vectors, but they're a vector field, so they have multiple lines. So the first thing we want to do is look at a field that's directed toward the top of a page. All right. So there's a field that would be going toward the top of the page. A field going to the right would look like this diagram here. And a field going into the page would look like this diagram here. So notice I have multiple lines, multiple X's showing the field going into the page. This diagram would be field coming out of the page toward you. And that's a diagram of field going toward the bottom of the page. Now the first part of using the right hand rule is to orient your fingers in the direction of the field because fingers are field. Multiple fingers, multiple field lines. So let's take a look at the first one. So if my field's oriented to the top of the page, all I have to do is point my fingers toward the top of the page in the direction of the field. That one's pretty simple. If my field is pointing toward the right, I have to orient my hand so that my fingers are pointing toward the right. Now sometimes it's a little hard to move your hand around, so one technique is you could also tr rotate your paper so that your paper is now has your hand fingers moving in the direction of the field. So that's a field moving to the right. And then a field going into the page would look like that. So you have to rotate your fingers so they're pointing toward the page. Again, field pointing toward the bottom of the page. We want to get our hand pointing 
fingers pointing, pointing toward the bottom of the page. This would be a good example when it's easier to just rotate the paper. All right, so now I've rotated the paper so my, my field is pointing that way and my fingers are aligned with it. This is the tough one, is field coming out toward you. So field coming out toward you, you gotta kinda contort your hand around that way so that it's coming up at you. Your fingers are pointing up toward your face. That one's a little bit on the harder side. Okay, let's look at the remaining parts of the right hand rule. We already have fingers are field, all right? Now the direction that the object is moving, we always point our thumb in that direction. And then we have the force is in the direction that our palm is facing. All right, so in this situation, my fingers are pointing up toward maybe the top of a sheet of paper. We'll make that the top, all right? My thumb is pointing toward the right, and then the force would be coming out of the paper because it's coming up, right, toward my face. It's pointing toward my face, so it's going out of the paper. If my palm was pointing that way, it would be going into the paper. So let's go through a couple examples. So here I have a diagram. You can see I have an object that's moving to the right, a field that's going to the top of the paper, and a force that's coming out of the paper. Well, how did I get at that? So if we start with just the field going toward the top, all right, then I have to orient my thumb in the direction of the blue arrow. Thumbs in the direction of the blue arrow. Now, you can see that my palm is facing up toward my face. So that means the force is coming up out of the page. Next example, I have a field that's going into the page. So what I have to do is I have to point my fingers down into the page, all right, and then rotate my hand so that my thumb is in the direction of the blue arrow, which is the velocity of the particle. So I move that way, and we can see that my palm is now facing the right edge of the page. So the force would be going to the right. Last example, all right? We have our field going this way to the left, and now I just have to get my thumb pointed in the direction of the arrow. So I rotate my hand around that way until my thumb is now in the direction of the arrow. Okay? You can see my palm is pointing down into the paper. So we have a force right here going into the paper. All right, so I've made this video so that you can kind of go back and look at it a couple times, go back through the examples, do them on the screen, and follow along with me. And hopefully this will help you out in understanding the three components of the right-hand rule. Remember, we point our fingers in the direction of the field, many field lines, many fingers. Thumb goes in the direction that the particle is moving, kind of like hitchhiking, you want to go that way, all right? And the force comes out of our palm. Now for all of these examples, I've been using positive palm and proton, making sure that the particle is a positively charged particle. If the particle is a negatively charged particle, such as an electron, all we have to do is figure out the force the exact same way and then reverse the direction. For example, on this problem, I have my force going into the page, but if the force were a negative particle, it would be going opposite, which would be out of the page. All right? So it's the same thing as like opposites attract, likes repel. When we did electric fields, we, had, we could have an electric field that moved a positive particle one way, a negative particle the opposite way. Electric charges in magnetic fields do the same exact behavior.